This morning I want to start a journey with you guys. I want, to, I want to start talking about an important subject, and it just feels like this is something that God has really been impressing on my heart for some time. Um, and I've been praying about it. I've been praying how to focus on it. I've been praying about how God wants me to move um, forward in it. And it would, for any of us, it's very noticeable. You watch the news, you watch the social media feeds, you um, watch the private conversations that people are having, even the conversations that are happening in public settings, at dinners, and so on and so forth. And that conversation is about justice. That conversation is about social action. That conversation is about people who feel like um, their situation or the place that they've arrived in is, to be real honest with you, there's prejudices against them. And this is a hard content to approach, so I would ask for your grace as I move through this. Now, I know that some people have abused that privilege. I know that there's some people out there who have um, taken the opportunity to appear to be entitled. And that is some of the conversation that's heating up, is that there's one side that feels like something is not being given to them that is appropriate. They're not, being, they're not receiving the dignity that they should as a human being. And then there are other people that are frustrated, saying that they're stirring up stuff, and it's just going back and forth. And like with everything that we face in this life, there are some people that is definitely the case. They are taking advantage of situations and should be held responsible for them. But then there are other people that um, are the people that like deep down the struggle that they're facing and what they're shouting out there is an indication that they are desperate for others to recognize them as human beings. Now, from the place of conception to the last breath, every human being is to be given dignity and to be treated not just fairly, but should be treated like a not, not just a human being, but a gift from God. And we've really lost track as a culture and in other societies, we've lost track of caring for people as such. Really loving people wherever they are. And I believe that some of the main issues with that have resulted in the legalization of abortion. That lives just don't matter as they did. That not even at conception do they matter. So this morning we posed the question initially, how valuable is a human being? How valuable is someone? How important are they? How special are they? Now, unfortunately, we have arrived in settings that have made this question really, really hard to answer. Now, some people would assume that personal or self-perception will define a human being's worth. Others would believe that societal perceptions. And of course, this morning, we're going to get down to talking about God's determination. God saying this is what a human being is worth. But we live in times right now where that is being, uh, that's being oppressed. That is definitely something that is being attacked. Now, if we look at a personal perception, there are sem several different factors that would create um, a personal feeling about who you are or who someone else is. Now, unfortunately, that is, um, you know, based on natural human emotions. Like, our natural human emotions become the barometer of what we feel we are or what we feel others are. We begin to, we begin to make assessments by um, perhaps their features. And this blends into the societal, societal per perception, but this is something that begins to affect what we believe about others because... 
you know, we allow ourselves in pride or arrogance, begin to look down on people. In Jeremiah 17, 9, this is a familiar verse. It's one that's very frightening if we really listen to it. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? In the message translation in verse 9 and 10, it says, The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. But I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I examine the mind. And so if you are personally broken... If your situation, whether you're there from birth, because we know that there are chemical imbalances that happen right out of the womb, okay? Or you have had experienced trauma in your life that has resulted in a perception that is skewed, a perception that changes about who you are, that begins to affect your uh, confidence in who you are. It begins to affect your value, or your perception of you. And if you're not careful, it can begin to affect your perception of others. Your own emotional state becomes a barometer. Your own emotional experiences. People that are different than you become the person that you look down upon or you see as someone who is not as important. Now, society has other ways to... Um, you know, to, to determine people's words, worth. Um, if you look at Wikipedia, not that Wikipedia has any value or anything like that, but if you look at Wikipedia, it, dis, it summarizes it this way. Um, value is of a human being is, is, is ascribed status, is a position assigned to individuals or groups based on traits beyond their control, such as sex, race, um, or parental social status, an achieved status is, a, is distinguished from ascribed status by virtue of being earned. And so if we take Wikipedia as an example or a, a defining thing about human, um, you know, about our perception of how valuable human beings are, then it would tell us that how a child is born, the family that they're raised in, the experiences that they've had, Male or female, all right, um, you know, diversity, all those different things will affect uh, the perception of someone. In both cases, however, whether that be a personal experience or society, in both cases, however, our status um, is directly dependent upon how others see us. How well we perform in social constructs. What social constructs means is, is the way that society has began to form opinion, perspectives, morality. You know, the way that society has shaped culture. And if we're not careful, those social uh, constructs can begin to change the way society lives within. If popularity isn't the right social measurement, what about economic value? Uh, let me be honest with you real quick. According to some estimates, a body could be worth up to $45 million. Calculated by selling the bone marrow, the DNA, the lungs, the kidneys, the hearts as components. However, if you just look at the value of the chemical components in a human being... We, can't, we, we come um, to a grand total of over $160 million. All right, so perhaps human value lies somewhere between $160 and $45 million. It depends upon the mass of the person and the quality of their organs. So maybe we can determine the value of someone by how much they're worth. Now that's absurd, obviously. And all of these perceptions are absurd. These, these values that we have that would cause us to make distinctions about someone's value. I've heard this statement before and it is appalling to me. I've heard people say that individual is just a waste of oxygen. That person is just a waste of oxygen. And those things should affect us. They should they, they should make us angry. They should upset us. 
because determining our value is really, it's just a roll of the dice, or a happy accident, or, or a fortunate coincidence. Or it, it could be a, a misfortunate event, or an unlucky accident. I mean, taking what society views as a person who is val- valuable, if you take just the upbringing of a child, whether that be in poverty or homes where drug addiction is common, I would not be considered by the, the, the society as a valuable individual. And there are many in this room because of your experience that others would look at and say, you're not valuable, you're not special, there's nothing important about you. And we have got to begin to, if we're going to approach this subject content right out the gate, if we're going to approach this subject content correctly, we have got to begin to look at what the Bible has to say. What the Bible has to say about a person's value. And if we look at what the the scriptures say, in Genesis 1.27, I didn't have time to write a PowerPoint, so maybe you guys can look at your Bibles or your app. <laughs> um, Genesis 1.27 through 30, this is a familiar set of verses. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue do it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and all the beasts of the earth and the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground. Everything that has breath in it I give every green plant for food. And it was so. So God created man and gave him the opportunity to live within the world in a fruitful way. Obviously, that's talking about having babies, but it's also talking about what is produced through humanity. Plants, you know, those kind of things, whether we're, we're um, working our gardens or our flower beds or Um, or we are working with people and creating new life through that focus. Now it goes on in chapter 2 to say this. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, now no shrub and yet, um, now no shrub and yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But the streams came up from the earth and watered the whole um, surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. In verse 8, now the Lord God had planted the garden in the east of Eden, and there he had, he had formed. There was something beautiful that was taking place in the garden. Now we know that from the dust of the ground, from the dust of the ground, God created man. And he shaped him, and then he breathed life into him. If you read the scripture, it says that man was created in the image of God which immediately ascribes value. And if, you know, just reading along in the message translation, just switching things up a little bit, it says, God had put man, this is verse 21, God had put man into a deep sleep, and as he slept, he removed one of his ribs and replaced it with flesh. And God then used the rib that he had taken from man to make a woman and presented her to the man. The man said, finally, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Name her woman, for she was made from man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and a mother and embraces his wife. They become one flesh. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked, but they felt no shame. All right? It was all good. Everything was great. They were in a good space. They were in a good place. The world was perfect. All was right. Humanity was seen and considered as 
something with value. They were created by the, 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 the verbal and physical manifestation of God. That he actually got down in the dirt and shaped a human being and breathed life into them. If that is not an indication that all human beings have value, I don't know what is. But we know the story. Something happened. There was a a terrible decision made. And Adam and Eve decided to partake of the fruit that they should not have partaken in. They decided that the enemy's ideal of knowing good and bad, that the enemy's lie about that would be something that they wanted to be able to see. And through that manipulation, they ate this fruit and they were made aware of their nakedness. They hid from God. Sin had entered the world. And we know how the story goes. There was now toil in work that Adam would have to give himself to. Women would have pain and childbirth among the many different things that were a result of their decision. And things just began to go downhill from that. And life began to be less valuable. We know about the children they had. Adam and Eve lay together and they had Cain and Abel. There was jealousy and envy that raged out of control. Cain killed Abel, right? First murder resulted from from jealousy. And in that instance, we see a man who thought that another man was stealing from him what he deserved or, or he saw Abel's life as as more valuable than he is than his own life or maybe he was jealous and didn't think that Abel was as deserving as he was and from that point on we have just watched as the world has began to decay you see God's creation is immense But man, as the crown of creation, has a dignity and grandeur that surpasses that of the cosmos. Therefore, scripturally speaking, humanity's unique worth is directly tied to being made in God's special image. In God's special image. There's a phrase that is familiar that I've heard um, from time to time, and it's called um, Amego Dei. It's a Latin word, and it means image of God. And so we are created in the image of God. There's this Amego Dei that happens, and we are created in God's image. We are made as a result of his spoken word. Not only are we made as a result of his spoken word, but we are also made with the understanding that God had said, let us make man in our image. That means that we bear within us the image of God. That's important. But in the fall of man, some people would think, well, because sinfulness entered the world and there was all this disaster, maybe man has lost his value. Maybe because of his sinfulness, he is then worthless. And another Latin word is tenebris, which means uh, darkness. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the, again, it says, the heart is deceit, deceitful above all things. And beyond cure. In Romans 1.21 it says. For although they knew God. They neither glorified him as God. Nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile. And their foolish hearts. Were darkened. And when we reflect upon humankind. When we reflect upon the darkness that has affected humanity. It, in its wonder displaying the perfection of God. It sinned. And since Then distinctions have been made. Categories of human value have been invaded, uh, have invaded our societies. Slavery has been begun. Um, You know, it is a statistic right now that there is more slavery in our world now than ever in our history. Women in the Bible times, in history long ago, had no rights, no privilege. Their, their accounts of stories. That's why it was so amazing that Mary was the first to witness Jesus' resurrection. That there was no value for individuals. And if any of us assume that we've not made these distinctions on our own, to be honest with you, we are deluded. 
because all of us are responsible. Like I was preparing this message and I had to take a serious um, investigative study of my own heart. I had to reflect on where I was and where I needed to be. I had to ask God, honestly, have I made these distinct distinctions? Have I looked on others and looked down on them because of their social status or because they aren't like me? I know that it's happened to us, but it's also happened from us. And whether we agree with the culture's fight for justice and equality in its many forms, one thing is clear. And this is my personal feeling. Take it as you want. I believe that in so many ways our culture, it, it, in, in our world, it's a cry of desperation. Some people just want to matter. Some people want to have worth. Some people want to be seen with value. Now, in the outreach, in that cry, I know that not everything is perfect. Not everything is easy. The truths aren't convenient. And within those cries for support and those cries for help, there are definitely sins that have integrated themselves in those cries, which have corrupted our view and corrupted their approach. But you would agree with me, right, that there is a whole lot of turmoil right now in our world because of people who are just different. Social status, the color of their skin, their nationality, where they were born, their economic status, their health. One of the things that have been made more clear to me than ever, and I ask God to forgive me every day for not noticing it. You know, there, there's, um, working at Easter Seals now, there's been opportunity for me to take kids into public places. You know, going to serve in the community. Going to um, Mary's and, and getting towels and washing them at the laundromat. You know, um, or going to the church in town here that serves meals and you know, washing down the tables and doing silverware. And I can't tell you the amount of times that there's been looks of disrespect, that there have been people who have actually avoided, and some people that have just been plain rude. Every person has value. Every person has value. And we have got to not only shift our thinking, but make ourselves aware of this reality. And one of the things that is awful to me is that sometimes Christians are the worst of offenders. Because we look at people that are not Christian, we look down on them. We look at them as, well, that's them, and this is us. We got it together. They don't have it together. But, you know, th this is them, and this is us. And we should never make distinctions between them and us. We should never make those decisions to say, well, they're in this place, and I'm in this place. Because the truth is, is we're all wretched. We've just made a different decision. And that was one to serve Jesus. And so in a falling humanity, in this darkness that we have found ourselves in, the other Latin word that I want to introduce you guys to is lux. And lux means light. And this is what happened in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. This is what it says. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That means he reconciled us and we are to go and teach others and preach to others and share with others the reconciliation that we have experienced. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he was committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made 
him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God or perfect. In the, new, uh, in the message translation, it, it says, uh, a new life burgones. It says, look at it. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him. It's a fresh start. It's a new beginning. Again, that doesn't make us different. I mean, it makes us different as in we've experienced the new birth. But, but in that, we need, we need to know that Christ has made an offer that since the darkness, the tenebrous, the darkness that the world has fallen into and people are continuing to sin, there's a propensity to hurt others in our existence because of the darkness that is settled within our hearts. And when we receive that freedom, when we come to the light, when God changes us, we then have an opportunity to step out there and be a valuable part of our society, speaking the hope of Christ and stopping at all possible ways hate and everything that it's come to cause. This can no longer appear being a passing fad. You see, the one thing I've noticed is that social justice electrifies our news, our social media, our social circles, all different avenues that there and outlets there are. And we get caught up in our moments, but follow through is often lacking, and that's at best. Sometimes we find that 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 you know the 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 value of human beings is a trending thing right now. Everybody's fighting for a cause. Everybody's fighting for their own value and their own stake in the world. Now, I know that integrated in that is definitely some self-entitlement. But if we were all honest, whether we're young or old, we all feel self-entitled every once in a while. Don't look at me like that. Right? I know I have. I know I have. And if we're not careful, it will cause us to miss the underlying desperation that needs to begin to surface. It's not standing for a cause and stopping that. You know, a lot of people think that education is the answer. We've got to educate. That's going to change people. Yes, we've got to educate. I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. We've got to do these certain things. We've got to go through these methods. You know, in my own life, in my own experience, time after time after time and time again, Jesus Christ alone is the answer. If you follow Jesus' ministry, you will see a man who disregarded public opinion, disregarded religious opinion, and found himself in the company of those who were, who were degraded, those who were ignored, those who who were not seen in culture as anything valuable. Not only was Jesus frequently seen with women, which was not counted as a good thing as he was a rabbi or a teacher, he, he spent time, they, they would, you know, Jewish culture would cause them to actually go around Samaria. So they didn't have to engage people there. And Jesus went right through. He sat down at a well with a woman who was with many men and came to saying, even the one that you're with right now is not your husband. And he spent time with her. And he talked to her about what he had to offer. He constantly rebuked the religious leaders and stood with those who are the marginalized, those who are not special by society's opinion. Human worth is God-given and something we are called to take up the banner for. In Mark 12, 28, we know this. There was, a, there was a, an argument that took place and one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? 
And this is what Jesus said. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love God with everything in you, every ounce and fiber of your being. Make it the effort to love God. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, neighbor is not just the person who lives next door to you. Some of you, that might be hard because your neighbors are like a few miles away. Um, or, you know, a little, bit, a, a little bit away. But loving your neighbor as yourself, he was speaking about our expression and affection to those in humanity around us. Neighbor included every person. To love your neighbor as yourself. To care for them. To step up for them. To watch out for them. To be there for them. It's time for us to dive deep into the topics of compassion. Into the topics of unity. Into the topics of ethics, race, faith. And how the church is involved in all of that. And our hope needs to be this. That bringing up these conversations, creating moments for these conversations to be at the forefront. We can move past Twitter rants and Facebook debates and places where people are no longer disillusioned, but inspired and equipped to step back into their communities with fresh eyes, with compassion in their hearts, with good news on their lips, ready to live as light in the dark world. We've got to do something. We're the church. And either we've been quiet for too long or we're shouting the wrong messages. We have got to do something. Now, I believe that settled within this community, settled within this body right here, the people that I'm talking to, I believe that there is a special and specific group of people that God can use for awesome things. When I say the church has, has not been so appropriate and not had said the right things, sure, we need to turn the, the microscope on ourselves and begin to in, invest um, some time in searching our hearts. But within this congregation, I believe that we can change things in the, in, in the culture, in the, in, the, in the areas that are right around us. We may not be able to necessarily fix the world problems, but we can fix, or with Christ's help, we can begin to fix the things within our world, the things that are right around us. Never be afraid to raise your voice. Never fear boldness, honesty, truth, and compassion against lying, against greed, against violence, against hate, and any other kind of injustice. We need to be the voice that shouts with steadfast conviction that our glorious Savior promised us and then challenged us, challenged us with. If Christians would do this, would love like God, I really believe it would change the world. It really would. So you have people within your life that you have, that you have influence with. It could be people at your work. It could be people in your schools. For those of you who are in schools, it could be people within this church right here. It could be your neighbors that live right next to you or the people in your community. It could be the people that you sit down and have coffee with at McDonald's or wherever you have coffee at. You have opportunity don't be belligerent about it. Don't be that forceful person that everyone wants to avoid because you're always raising the banner, okay? Be careful. Start conversations, though. Start conversations. Because the value of a human being has been affected in a horrid way. And God considered us so precious. in our darkness and our brokenness. Hey, he would send his perfect son to redeem us. 
Who are we to tell anybody that they don't have worth? Jesus Christ, I ask right now that you would speak to us. And as you speak to us, that our hearts would be opened. God, that we would change our focus. And Lord, as we engage in this conversation, as we engage in this uh, series, God, that you would help me. God, that I would not speak out of turn, that I would not speak of things that I don't understand. God, that you would help me to stay humble knowing that this affects me too, and it's affected my heart as well. God, help us to see people as you see them. Worthy enough, important enough, special enough for you to let your son die so that we could find freedom. May we love you with every ounce of our being, and may we love our neighbors. Amen.